All right. So four of the eight points listed on page seven we covered a week ago, and that is the obstacle of fear. It's a major one. Again, pages eight and nine, we're going to focus even more on that. And discouragement, meaning just our efforts in the past and it didn't work out well for us and talking to others and inviting others and we get discouraged and, and um, kind of give up maybe, throw in the towel when it comes to this important work of personal evangelism. Uh, we have to make sure we don't have any prejudice in our hearts and not just with the color of someone's skin, though that's included for sure, but also being prejudiced in our minds and kind of writing someone off our prospect list because of the sin and immorality in their life and say, well, they'll, we'll kind of conclude, well, they'll never listen. So we never even give them the opportunity uh, to accept or reject the gospel message. And we, we really have to uh, watch ourselves on that. And then lack of zeal. Uh, maybe we've become lukewarm. Maybe not lukewarm just as a Christian as a whole or in general, but we can become lukewarm in specific areas and certainly we can become, and I think in many instances God's people have, in the work of personal evangelism, that uh, we've become lukewarm, that we've become complacent. And if that's the case, we need to be like, remember Jeremiah, who's talked about God's word, was like a fire shut up in his bones, and he was weary of holding it back, and he could not, but he had to speak it. And we need to be like that. And um, we need to, if, we, if we've been lukewarm, and lack zeal, then as Christ said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, repent and be zealous. And so the next four we want to focus on, our attention is selfishness, having a lack of knowledge of God's word, putting forth really no real effort. And so we're not going to see any real results then of people being saved if we're not doing that. And then perhaps we've lost sight of, of heaven and that, as we just prayed, that most important goal of all. Um, so selfishness, Luke 14, this is not in the book, just adding it. Uh, you know, since I have so much time, I thought I'd add it. Um, Gil, go ahead and read that for us, please. Luke 14, verses 16 through 20. Luke 14, 16 through 20. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. What do we oftentimes say or think? I'm too busy. And it's not that there's, no, that there's not truth to that statement, oftentimes. We, we do have busy lives, and um, maybe th those who are older and your kids are grown, you think back when the kids were at home and, and uh, how busy you really were then, running here, running there, uh, to uh, whether it's school or sports and the various activities and raising the family. Uh, but it doesn't mean after the kids are grown and gone that, well, you're just not busy anymore. Uh, we do have busy lives, and we are to stay busy, but we're supposed to especially stay busy in the Lord's work. And busy in the Lord's work, a big part of that is evangelism and teaching uh, the lost the gospel. And that's, you know, what Gil just read for us here in Luke 14. That's basically what they were all saying. I'm just too busy. I got too much going on. I can, right now is not a good time for me to just drop everything and come to your great supper and, and accept this invitation. And, and so uh, they all began to make excuses why they couldn't attend this great supper. And so the first one said, in verse 18, I bought a piece of ground. I, I need to go and see it right now. I got to go check that out. So I asked you to have me excused. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I, I need to find out how they're going to work in the fields for me. I need to test them out. And the third one said, I married a wife, and so I, I can't come. I don't know if they just married the, his wife that day, going on a honeymoon or what, but, uh, or it's just new, newlyweds. But, you know, all of them ultimately were lame excuses, 
And that's what they were. They weren't reasons. They were excuses. And the master, here pictured as a lord, was upset and justifiably so. And many others then were invited who weren't originally invited to come partake of the great supper. But we can kind of be like that, maybe without realizing, well, I'm just, I'm just too busy to do it. Well, when then we're too busy, maybe in the wrong things, or we're not managing our time well, and, and, and maybe not redeeming the time as we're told to. And maybe it's a problem of, of selfishness. We become too focused on ourselves and our lives rather than the work of the Lord. And so sometimes it's a matter of selfishness. It's a matter of setting the right priorities in our life and getting maybe that refocused uh, again. So let's read Matthew 6, 33, Sean. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. All right, so number one priority, Jesus says, should be what? Seek what first? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. So God, the things of God, the kingdom of God, the righteousness of God, that is to be first in our lives. Not the physical. The, the latter part says, after that, what? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. What are these things? Well, that's the, that's the physical he's been talking about, beginning about verse 25 to that point. Uh, God will take care of the physical. Our focus needs to be on the spiritual, on his kingdom, on his righteousness. And when those things get out of alignment, and they can and oftentimes do, we, we need to get things back aligned properly. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Again, thinking about this idea that maybe I'm, that I, it could be a matter of selfishness, too focused on myself and my life and my things instead of the things of the Lord and the lost around me. Drew, Philippians 2, 3 and 4. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but for the interests of others. All right. So how many things are we to do through selfish ambition? One, two. The most important things we got going on? No. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. It's not about, it's not about me. It's about him, and it's about others, right? And, and so in verse 4, um, or even at the end of verse 3, just to, the mindset we're to have of humility and then esteeming others better than myself. And, and, and that mindset, that perspective, certainly is key with uh, the work of evangelism. That I'm not who's most important and, and, and my things are, are, are not most important. It's others and not just my things. Not that I can't take an interest in my own things, verse 4. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests. Of course, we're going to naturally do that in the interest of our family. There, there's a place for that. But he reminds us, but also, don't forget, forget about the interest of others. And, and here's the greatest interest of others, their soul and their spiritual condition and relationship with Almighty God. Um, and so, whether it's our brethren, and, and this may be more so in this context, but in others in general, we need to, to have that proper uh, mindset and perspective, right? Okay, anything to quickly add on this point of selfishness before moving on? Okay, if not, lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. Um, that is very important, obviously, when we're talking about teaching others, sharing the gospel with others, that we don't have to be able to have the Bible memorized. Uh, we don't necessarily have to be able to quote all the verses that um, are more uh, focused or helpful in that particular area, even though that's not a bad idea. But we don't have to do those things in order to, to teach someone else. But we do have to have a, a reasonable knowledge of the truth to impart truth uh, to, to the lost. And we touched on this in the first lesson. Uh, with the Hebrews 5, 12 passage. By this time, you ought to be what? We have that letter B here. By this time, you ought to be teachers. Again, what's implied there? 
by this time. I mean, enough time in your life as a Christian has passed from, since your conversion that you should be over here and you've slid actually back over here and you need someone to teach you again the elementary principles, the first principles of the oracles of God, right? And, and so as we emphasize, you, if you forgot that, I mean, that goes back to page five. It's time for you to teach. And we have seven points there. And this is uh, material again from Dempsey Collins on that. But um, a lot of great points that he makes there from the Hebrews 5.12 passage that's time for you to teach. But for us to teach, we have to have knowledge. And I think sometimes, and this will, I think this point maybe will bleed over to uh, page 8, uh, one of the problems of fear, we, we, we have a feeling of inadequacy. We, sometimes we have a feeling of inadequacy when it comes to our, our, our knowledge. Well, I don't think I know enough. Or I'm not for sure if I know enough to teach someone else. Um, well, for one thing, letter A, that is why classes like these are needed. And we want, that's kind of the, one of the purposes. We want to help better equip all of ourselves uh, for this great work. Uh, letter C, did you know enough to be baptized? Well, I hope so. If not, you weren't truly converted, right? Um, in other words, did you, um, what did you do to obey the gospel? And if you know that, can you not share that with others, what you did to be saved, right? So when the jailer asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Did he find out that same night and into the early hours? You know, about midnight was the earthquake. So those early hours of that next day, did he and his family find out what they needed to do to be saved? They understood it, right? And in fact, there was an immediate response to that. So do you think after maybe they got some rest, <laughs> But do you think pretty soon after that, like right away, they could probably share with others what was shared with them that they need to do to be saved without being full-time evangelists or gospel preachers? And that's what Christians in the first century did. They were taught and they went out and taught others. And, and so we don't have to know everything. I mean, we're talking about the gospel. We're talking about the basics, aren't we? I mean, it's essential to be saved. It's the power of God and the salvation. But think about it in, in, even in that simplistic way when we might feel like, well, I don't know enough. Well, did you, did you know enough to be baptized? Did you understand what you did to obey the gospel? If not, then we need to sit down and study again. But if you did, then you, you, you can share those things. And then, of course, keep learning. Increase your knowledge, as we studied and referenced before in 2 Peter 3.18, but growing in the grace and the, and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ken? I guess... Most of us do know the basic steps for obeying the gospel of becoming a Christian. But I, guess, I guess the rub comes where you, where you need to find the scriptures that back that up. And that's probably something that we could all work on. Uh, sit down and write down those basic steps and then look up the scriptures that go with it. Yeah. And keep that in your wallet or in your purse, you know, so that you have it ready. You know what I sometimes wish we had was an old-fashioned chalkboard. Or a whiteboard, because I'd grab a marker or a piece of chalk right now, and just as an example, we, we could write it up there um, here. And what passage would come to mind? Okay, there's, that's a big one right there, right? Romans ten seventeen. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And, and of course, we can incorporate other scriptures that emphasize we have to hear. You know, Jesus said that a lot. He who has ears to hear, let him hear as he's teaching. Um, but we have to hear the word of God because God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So I've got to hear and, and understand that, that, that truth, have a knowledge of it. And, and so what, what would be a good exercise, and, and we, this is simple enough, at, at home or if we, <laughs> if, we, if we had time in class, right? We can write down uh, believe and just have maybe two scriptures or one to begin with. One's fine. But if you 
after you learn that one, maybe you want to add another one that you, you're comfortable with and you think that that's a, that's a great verse to share with somebody about belief. And, and most people already know John 3.16, right? So there's that. And then when you, we say repent, well, it's good to know of Scripture or two to reference on repentance, whether it's Jesus in Luke 13, 3, where he said, repent, or you will likewise perish. So what does that tell us right there, that statement? Is repentance necessary? Yeah, if I don't, Jesus says, I'll, I'll be lost. And so that implies necessity, repentance. And then maybe go to a Scripture that talks more, well, what is repentance? What are we talking about? But at, whether Acts 2.38, Acts 17.30. But do that with, you know, as we think about the conditions of salvation, um, to have some scriptures in mind. But even as we back it up before that, um, what scriptures and, and what passages and what points do we want to make? And, and part of the hearing, people need to hear about what? They, they, they need to hear about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, don't they? I mean, there's the, the core, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, there's the heart or core of the gospel message. Jesus died for our sins, and he was buried, and he was raised on the, the third day. And so that, uh, and, and, and we need to, people need to realize that we're trying to teach that we have sin, that, that Christ was sent to save us from, and so God's grace and his mercy and so certainly we want to cover scriptures or passages that talk about that. But again, if we have, you know, we don't have to have a, a plethora of them. We don't have to have a bunch of them. Just if we start off with one to, to go through and then build upon that, add to that. Go ahead, Jeff. For me, the first Corinthians 15 is a great one. And then if you use one of the examples from Acts, so, so if you kind of show the God, here's what Paul said in the gospel is, here's an example right. of how someone received it. That's, and that way you're not flipping, so, sometimes flipping all over the place with somebody can be, especially if they're not real familiar with the Bible, right. can be a little bit distracting or they're trying to, trying to find stuff and all this. But if, you know, just a couple of passages can, of those key ones can show what the gospel is and show how it's received. Sure, so that's a great suggestion. So Acts is what? It's oftentimes referred to appropriately as a book of conversions. It has all these great conversion stories for us. And so why not familiarize yourself with one of those at least that you're real comfortable with, whether that's the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, whether that's the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8, uh, whatever it is, just have kind of a go-to for yourself that you've read over and read over and, and, and you're familiar with. And yeah, for someone who's a novice to the scriptures, jumping all over the place, I mean, certainly I've had the studies where um, maybe they don't have a Bible or I bring a Bible that's identical to mine and they're just not familiar with the books. And so I'll say a page number. And so they're not embarrassed and they're not flipping all, all over the place and are going to the table of contents each time I mention a book. They can just go to that page number and they're right there. Or we might have some material printed off that is uh, kind of assist as well. But Jeff's idea, suggestions as well is, is very helpful. It's kind of keep it simplistic, but still powerful, right? Uh, Lena? Well, the question like you uh, uh, made an example of that, well, what must I do to be saved is a very rare thing that would start a conversation to begin with. The same as the story of uh, Philip and the eunuch. Uh, he was already reading the Bible, and uh, Philip suggested the help there. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you start the thing when the person is not seeking? When, uh, well, you start the conversation. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, those are two great um, texts to cite that Lena did there. And Acts 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch, he had already been up to Jerusalem to worship. He's on his way back. What is he doing? He's reading the Bible or reading Scripture, right? He's reading the Word of God. And Philip uses that as his catalyst or springboard, if you will, to preach Jesus to him. Uh, what are you reading? Do you understand what you're reading? And he joins them in the chariot and they have a Bible study. And uh, a soul is saved, a soul is converted to Christ. Or Acts 16 that we referenced earlier with the jailer, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He knew these were uh, teachers of God that had come to Philippi. And thankfully it wasn't just him, he gathered his family because he and his household were taught and were saved. And uh, I mean, there's no greater question someone could ask, but then we have the answer there. 
And it's not that we can't connect other scriptures to that story. We can. That will be helpful. Um, but yeah, those are two great places to go to. What I mean is, how do you become a person like you made uh, an example in the very beginning of the study? The guy that you went to the restaurant with and before you know he started the conversation with the waitress. How do you start by going to have a lunch or dinner and then all of a sudden you talk about the Bible? This kind of story has always impressed me, but I've never been able to do that. That's coming up. That's in the material. And so I'm going to hold off on that. But yeah, those are the kind of things that, are, that we need to know that are helpful to us, the, the, the practical things. How do we initiate those conversations? How do we initiate a Bible study with someone? And, and we have that in the material. So we're going to get to that. Thank you for already thinking about that. Let me get to the next point. No real effort. Okay. Um, isn't that true of, of many members of the Lord's Church, whether we want to raise our hand and say, yeah, I'm guilty of that. Um, we probably all could to, to some extent that I haven't, whether it's I haven't put forth the effort, you know, any effort or some effort, but not enough effort. Uh, souls aren't going to be saved, obviously, <laughs> if Christians are not putting forth the effort to teach the lost, right? I mean, that's just, that's just common sense. And so we have to take the seed out of the barn and plant it. In the parable of the sower, as recorded in Luke's account there in Luke 8, verse 11, Jesus says, as he explains that parable, the seed is what? The Word of God. The seed is the Word of God. And um, I don't know if I included the, the, that material in the workbook, but I remember thinking back to some of Dempsey Collins' uh, material on personal evangelism. He has a page or two dealing with the seed principle. But if we just take the seed as they did in the first century, which is the Word of God, the Gospel, and when that was planted in a person's heart and that was received and that was believed, what did it produce every time? Uh, it produced just a simple Christian, a follower of Christ, right? We understand that if we, if we take, and if I go back in my library here and I grab the Book of Mormon and I begin teaching you that and you accept that seed, what are you going to become? Not just a simple New Testament Christian, I converted you to Mormonism, right? Or if I take the, out of my library, the Catholic Catechism, and that's what I teach you out of, I've just, and you accept it. I just made you what? A Catholic. But if we just take the seed, the Word of God, 1st century, 21st century, and that's what we present and share every single time when that's accepted and believed and obeyed, it's only going to produce a New Testament Christian, right? I say only. I mean, that's what it should produce, and that's wonderful. Um, but again, for that to happen, we have to get the seed out of the barn, and we have to get this out of our mouth, and we have to, to share it with others um, and plant it. Because as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Okay? And, and, and God's Word says that we believe that, we accept that, but that's what we have to do. We have to plant, we have to water with God's Word, and He will bring the increase. But we have to, we have to examine ourselves. How, how much effort am I really putting forth? How much effort is this church putting forth? Uh, because obviously there can be, there's going to be some growth from our, hopefully our children who are, who are teaching and raising and, and their precious souls, right? Just like we think of the souls out here, they need to be converted to Christ. And so there's growth when they obey the gospel and then we maybe have families that move into the community and, and they join us here in the work uh, but we have to go out and, and teach others for this work or any work of the Lord's to grow and continue to grow. We have to put forth the effort, and it takes a lot of effort. We're talking about the you know, personal evangelism, but it's the work <laughs> of personal evangelism. Okay, uh, any quick points before I move on? Go ahead, Jesse. I was going to say maybe this comes out later too. But the no real effort for me is opposed by, on the other side, no real interest. And what I mean by that is especially in the information age where there's internet and phones and people leave tracks in bathrooms and on store shelves and stuff like that. It, it's like people could trip over it if they were interested. And I'm not saying that that absolves me of responsibility. The same things that Christians did in the 17 and 1800s 
have been co-opted by the government. They provide a lot of those services now that, if you will, give us competition to care for people and do the things that we ought to be about doing. So I, I don't know if that comes out later in the series, too. I would talk all day. You, you've known me long enough to know. If there was a person interested, they would talk their ear off. And when I was a 12-year-old boy, I knew batting averages and hits and runs and all that kind of stuff. And there has to be an excitement or a zeal or your own interest or why this has benefited me and this is why it can benefit you right. kind of a thing. Yeah. But finding interested people is, is difficult. And it, like I told you before, some are interested in behind the scenes on computer screens doing searches and studies that way. Yeah. But it is, like Lena said a minute ago, really hard to just sort of initiated. Yeah, so we, we have on our part, we have to have a zeal. We have to have an enthusiasm and a happiness, a joy, excitement about our being a Christian, but then that coming across and talking to others. But certainly there's plenty of people out here that are just indifferent, right? They could care less. But also we know, as we've stated, <laughs> the harvest is plentiful and the labors are few. And that's what we're hitting right now. The labors are few. We've got to put forth the effort. We've got to put forth the work and pray that, as Paul even said, pray for open doors. Uh, just like he prayed in the first century, we need to pray for that. And sometimes I think we miss those opportunities, those open doors. And we have a lesson that's going to hit on that a little bit more coming up. Um, but appreciate those points. All right. Mm -hmm. How to create interest. I, I, I think that kind of ties back a little bit to what Lena was saying. Um, so do you have an answer you want to give us before we move on? How to create interest? What happens when we die? What's going to happen when you die? Yeah. Are you dead like Rover, the dog? It's all good. You're dead all over. Yeah, and I think those those are some of the questions um, that do tie into what Lena was saying. That uh, someone who you know, I would say, and I may talk about it more later think about April's father who's the only Christian in his family and what a preacher said to him years ago where he, he wasn't thinking about it, wasn't on his radar, he was more or less indifferent, wasn't that he didn't believe in God, he did, it wasn't that he wasn't religious at all, he was to some extent, but I mean he wasn't going to church anywhere or anything and the one thing that got him, that stuck him was Jesus' question in Matthew 16, 26, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Because the way her dad, Steve, responded, the first few things he was saying, I got to do, he's a farmer, he's busy, got to do this, got to do that. And, and then he hit him with that. And that hit him like a ton of bricks. And that's what led him to come. That's what led him uh, to eventually learn the gospel and now be an elder in the church. Uh, Norm? Uh, use the example of fishermen and fishing and all that kind of stuff a, a lot. Uh, in, in the country folk era, <laughs> around here, you know, a lot of people fish and stuff. But so, so it's it's a pretty good example for us too. The the idea if you got a butt, if you got a lake full of fat fish because people <clears throat> feed them junk, you know, and they're just not not hungry. You know, that's uh, it's not the place to the fish. But you don't know that till you throw your your rod in, in the water. And uh, our job is to be attractive right. to to them to uh, to draw Jesus. People were drawn to him because of who he was, and so yeah. that's why the the effort to put to become the kind of godly person that stands out that people would notice then becomes the draw for those of that type. Yeah. Uh, and the fat fish are just the, eating all the junk uh, are not going to be drawn to anything. <laughs> and so what you just said gets into lesson three on the power of a good example, okay? Because that right there can lead to contacts, the prospects, the open doors because of the life that we're living. Um, all right, Jeff, can you grab, if you haven't already, the Hebrews passage on point eight, Hebrews 11, um, and just read all that, 13 through 16. Andy, can you read 1 Peter 2, 11? And John, can I give you those last two, please? Philippians 3.20 and Colossians 3.2. Um, and so this last point, maybe another hindrance or obstacle to us saving souls, is it possible we've lost sight of heaven? And I might add to that, have we lost sight of hell? 
um, and, and we, we ought not, we better not, but in the, in, and not just for ourselves, but I'm talking about those we're trying to teach, that if, as Jesus said in Matthew 7, many are on the, the broad road that leads to destruction, then what does that tell us? That most people out here, sadly, tragically, they're on that broad path, and we want to get them off and get them on that narrow path that, that, that leads to life. And so, yeah, we must not lose sight of heaven and... And uh, what that all means, and, and, and Jeff's going to read that in just a moment, part of that. Um, but we also must not lose sight of the other place, hell, for, yes, ourselves, but for all those right now who are on that path leading there. Uh, Jeff, go ahead, please. These all died in faith without having received the promises, but they saw them from a distance, greeted them, and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. Now those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they were, if they were thinking about where they came from, they would have had an op opportunity to return. But they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Okay. So one of the point, points of these verses I'm, we're bringing out, we need to remember that we're just we're strangers and pilgrims on the earth. What does that remind us of? This world's not our home, as we sometimes sing, right? We're just passing through. Um, and um, before we read 1 Peter 2.11, Philippians 3.20. Go ahead and read that right now, if you will, John. Philippians 3.20, what did Paul say there? For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so that ties in well. We're, we're, we're pilgrims, we're sojourners, we're strangers, we don't belong here. Our sights are to be set on that heavenly country. Our citizenship, as, as John just read, Philippians 3.20, is in heaven. And Paul says, for which we eagerly wait for who? For the Savior. You, you hear that excitement? And, I, and I've always loved those two, two words put together. Uh, you got wait, but then right in front of you, you got eagerly. Right? You're eagerly waiting. Right? You like that? Uh, uh, Andy, 1 Peter 2.11, please. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Again, there's that mindset that makes all the difference. If we could keep that proper perspective. Uh, we're only here temporary. We're just passing through. We're, we're, we're pilgrims. We're sojourners. And part of that is, okay, the way we must live our life, then we're going to abstain from these fleshly lusts. We're, we're, we want to go to heaven. We're headed there. And that's where our sights are set. And uh, we want to help others and help them set their sights on the big picture, right? Instead of just the here and now, like the rich fool of Luke 12, broaden that and think about God and think about, you know, kind of the questions that Larry was raising earlier. Where are you going to go when you die? What's next? Have you thought about that, right? We, and some people want to push that out of their minds, but we need to think about our mortality, right? Um, and we want to, others to think about that in regards to their soul. Um, you've already read Philippians 3.20, so uh, Colossians 3.2, please, uh, John. Just set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Okay. Keep a heavenly perspective, right? Focus our minds upward, not here below. And that's hard, that's hard to do. It's, it's because we're flesh and blood, we're living life, we're on this earth, and yet I'm a, we're strangers, we're pilgrims, we're sojourners. I love what Jacob said when he appeared before Pharaoh in Egypt when he was asked how old he was. But the way he worded it with his age was the years of my sojourn. I like that. The years of my pilgrimage. Just a pilgrim, just a sojourner, Right? Um, but though we're just passing through, we're trying to, to save us. We want to say through Christ, save ourselves, our families, and, and as many as we can as we head there. And so let me move on real quick. I've got about five minutes. That's great. Can we pause the clock? <laughs> All right. Uh, don't fear men. Teach them. Page eight. The fear of man brings a snare. We read this earlier on the previous page, first point. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. All right, if you're on page 8, let's read that material together for a little while. 
It was a golden opportunity, or so it seemed. For weeks I had been wanting to say something to them about their soul, but so many questions and negative thoughts kept getting in the way. When would be the best time, and what will I say when the occasion arises? Maybe I'm just not cut out for this kind of work. It's so unlike me to initiate anything with other people, let alone a Bible study with someone I hardly know. There are so many others who can do this better than I can. Perhaps you recognize the dilemma. If so, you also realize that often in the midst of such thinking, the opportunity slips away with nothing being accomplished. When we let such occasions to sow or cultivate go by because of self-doubt, it is time for some serious soul-searching and decision-making. Can I blame my neglect to confess Christ before men upon a shy personality, or is it simply spiritual cowardice? Even if it may be timidity, will the Lord allow that as an excuse for not teaching His Word? Or for that matter, doing other activities such as leading prayer in public, reading the Scripture, and so on. To the evangelist Timothy, Paul wrote, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1.7. The Amplified translation reads, quote, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, of cowardice, of craving and cringing and fawning fear, but He has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a calm and well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. Too many souls were lost in sin. Timothy could not afford to be shy with the only means of cleansing, and neither can we. Someone had the courage to teach us the gospel, which may have been no easy task, but would never have done so if they tried to excuse themselves by blaming timidity. Paul went on to tell Timothy that being timid with the gospel is equivalent to being ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, verse 8. There are three basic problems involved in timidity. The degree of any of these depends on various factors during our upbringing. While some are definitely more shy than others, all of us must fight this battle, even the greatest of speakers. And so again, that scripture from 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Who wants us to have a spirit of fear? The devil, Satan. Because as you remember the passage we brought up last week in Acts 18, the Lord appeared to Paul in a vision while he was at Corinth and he told Paul what? Do not be afraid. Do not keep silent, right? But you know, do not be afraid, but speak. Do not keep silent for I am with you. And we said, what often times happens when we become afraid and fearful? We do keep silent. When we have a spirit of fear instead of a spirit of power, what happens? Are we talking to, to others about Jesus and inviting them to services? No. Are we going to be inviting them to the gospel meeting upcoming in, in the end of, of March uh, here? Uh, probably not um, if we have a spirit of fear that we allow to overtake us. Doesn't mean we still don't have uh, a little bit of fear or shyness to push through. But again, God's not given us that, but a spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. And so, as we just read, three basic, basic problems that we want to explore here a little more deeply. And that is a feeling of inadequacy a fear of failure, and a fear of rejection, okay? And so, number one, a feeling of inadequacy is part of the problem. We feel inadequate to meet the situation. We fear that we're incapable of the task, or at least of doing it well. And then he cites some wonderful Old Testament examples for us of uh, people that maybe we didn't realize or we forgot about, maybe we need to be reminded of, oh yeah, they had those same kind of feelings when God called them to a specific work. We think of Moses, we probably don't think of someone that was too fearful unless we think back to the very beginning when he made all these excuses to God in Exodus chapter 3 and 4 of why 
It's basically send anybody else who you wish, just not me, to go do what you want me to do in Egypt, right? You remember that? But I mean, later on, wow, the leader he became. Go ahead, we got 745. And we'll see that with Gideon, Saul, and Solomon, and Jeremiah. And so if you haven't read this part of our lesson, please read it. Read the scriptures. Make notes by it if you want to. And as you're working on the next lesson, and go ahead and do that, if you will, lesson three. And um, lesson three on page 10 is the title of it, The Importance and Power of a Good Example. But on page 11, with the Christian example, you get all these scriptures, uh, read them and then jot down some notes there so we can maybe go through that a little bit quicker, okay? All right, did you never get a book?